There we go. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Chicago. Thank you for making the journey. Uh, my name is Kurt Wechter, and this is my colleague, Wes Couch. Um, first off, I would like to say thank you again to uh, Angie and uh, Reluca for their excellent speeches, and I can't applaud them enough, so can we please give them another round of applause? Um, so our uh, presentation is Scaling Selenium to Infinity. Um, just a summary of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I just want to do a quick recap of test hygiene. I can't uh, say it as well as Angie did, but uh, please uh, use the resources she gave you guys uh, to practice good test hygiene. Uh, and then we'll be going over our goals and challenges with uh, scaling Selenium. Um, from brainstorming uh, to the solution we came up with, uh, a little bit deeper dive and running tests in AWS Lambda with Selenium, and then some of the lessons we learned after our efforts this, uh, over this last 12 months. Okay, test hygiene, setting yourself up for success. Uh, first, I wanna go over what I like to call the battle days, uh, which is a test ice cream cone. So uh, if you look at the bottom of this, these are automated tests in uh, the battle days. And the bad old days, you might only release once a year, or you might hope to release next year, and you'll call your product, my product 2018, that you don't release until 2020. Uh, because if you look at the top, most of your uh, functional testing is manually done. And by the time that reaches to a manual test team, uh, they might find some really, really bad bugs that you actually have to really overhaul big components of your uh, application. So that creates the release schedule, makes uh, an impact in the release schedule, and it slows things down. Um, and I'm sure we've all had our share of the battle of days and why we were not gonna go back. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, show you uh, the practical test pyramid and just wanna give a quick shout out uh, to the Watermelon blog that gave me permission to use their images because I think they were really fantastic and I couldn't have done a better job. So please check them out. Um, we all know and love the, the test pyramid. Um, this one for me, that I personally experienced is a practical way to have one for a really large team and for a really mature product. Uh, if you look at the bottom, we obviously all, I'm sure you've heard, you wanna have as many uh, unit tests as possible to, co to give you coverage if it's possible. Um, in the middle, you have various other uh, more complicated tests that will give you coverage for things that you couldn't do unit tests for. And then we got the top there, uh, automated end-to-end -end tests and uh, manual, this uh, murky area, manual exploratory testing. And so, um, for, for me to make a practical end-to-end -end suite, and these are tests that, you know, they're not quick tests. They'll probably take, you know, 20 or 30 seconds to run a user workflow. It might log in, it might generate some backend data first before it even starts, just so a feature can be tested. Um, but then some of those situations we all know are what I like to call rude, some really rude tests. Uh, they're hard to automate, or they are not nice to other tests because it changed the state of the system and so you really can't run it in parallel. Um, and so then you really can't trust those tests. So uh, at Blackboard, uh, uh, especially through the guidance of uh, Ashley Hunsberger, <laughs> we come up with the term happy path. So we want as many of our E2E tests to be happy path tests. And if they're not happy path tests, you should have a conversation about why. Um, this is a happy path. It's very basic. Step one, two, three. It should work. It stop. It should be very easy to understand how, how this test works. Um, happy paths tests, end-to-end uh, -end tests, make good neighbors. Uh, they get along with other tests, and they're short and sweet. Uh, they shouldn't take any more than a minute. If it takes more than a minute, uh, that is probably a bigger problem. Non-happy path tests, they're rude to other tests. They take a long time. Um, they need to go to charm school. <laughs> uh, goals and challenges that we've had uh, during this scaling endeavor. So we uh, had a lot of uh, focus on organizational problems with our development team in the past, and we made a lot of great progress, and we were kind of ready for the next thing, like, let's run it faster. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we wanted to give faster feedback to the team when they're running, uh, they, you know, we run a full regression on every commit of every feature branch for over 100 developers worldwide, 24 hours a day. That's kind of, that's a lot to ask for. Um, it was our, we really wanted to, with all that many people working, uh, you know, making uh, faster feedback, it's uh, exponential velocity for us. It's like a force multiplier. So if we can just save people time, you know, we would really impact, have a big impact on the quality of the product. Um, infrastructure as code. Um, I don't like babysitting servers, and I would like to get out of the business of doing that. So if there's anything I can do to make our test infrastructure easier to maintain, you know, I'm all for it. Um, I've had the pleasure of using some really great software products at Sauce Labs uh, that have videos that I love. And I really, uh, I, it's like once you have the videos, it's really hard to go back. Like I, I can't, uh, it's, you know, when you see, when I'm working and I see people that don't have videos, I'm like, if you just had the video, we would save like three days of just troubleshooting. Uh, and lots of great logs. Um, I love all, you know, the more the merrier. Sometimes that's really hard to uh, implement, depending on your test infrastructure, and you end up getting, you know, babysitting servers just to get better logs, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of overhead. Uh, and of course, the, uh, uh, you know, the unachievable dream, at least for us, it always seemed like, how can we get everything to run all at once in parallel? Make it so fast that, you know, we don't have to worry about this anymore. Like, it's, that'll solve all our problems, right? And then, uh, like I said, I was covering some of the challenges. It was just, uh, we wanted speed, lots of people, and it's a really complex product. And uh, now the, I'd like to hand off to Wes. He's gonna talk about uh, how we brainstormed it and uh, how we implemented our scaling solution. Thanks. Um, so while we were brainstorming these challenges and the solutions to them, um, we were kind of working through the notion of, you know, we've got our Selenium grids, we're using uh, containerized services, we're getting to a parallel point um, where we're running pretty quick, but like we want to take that next step, and we're, we're always looking for that next step. And we, f we felt like we kind of exhausted our um, solutions for that. Um, and we had some experience in the past with AWS Lambda, and um, kind of if you get to the root of what it really is, um, it's basically just a container. Um, it's a very opinionized container, and uh, you run under a strict set of guidelines when you're in that container. Um, but if you know what the guidelines are, you can also kind of take advantage of them, which is where we saw um, the ability to jump in there. So why would you even want to run Selenium tests in Lambda? Well, parallel execution is virtually unlimited and no additional cost. If you ask Amazon for more servers, they'll give them to you. Um, you don't have to manage the scaling. Um, they start you off with 1,000 concurrent Lambda sessions. We bumped ours up to 16,000. Just in case, you know, you never know when you need to run 16,000 tests at the same time. Um, Working on it. <laughs> um, and it's also lower maintenance. We didn't want to have to manage the Selenium grid, like uh, Kurt was mentioning. And uh, we really want to keep all of our infrastructure as code. We don't want to manage the scaling, um, which is a common issue when you get to Selenium grids, because you have to manage um, all the scaling. Um, so for our first iteration, uh, we ran into Marco Luthi's uh, article where he ran headless Chrome in Lambda. And that was a big first step uh, because being able to run any type of UI automation in Lambda um, had never been done before. And we kind of saw the path align um, where we might be able to use Selenium with that as well. So we took his build of Chrome, which was a highly specialized build of Chrome, um, and we took Selenium and packaged it with it, and we were able to run Selenium tests in AWS Lambda with that headless Chrome. Um, if you've ever used headless Chrome versus a full browser uh, Selenium test, um, there are some limitations that come with that. And unfortunately, uh, those limitations were enough to make it so that we couldn't use that version of Selenium and Chrome together, because we needed those things like browser alerts, um, and as well as iframes, which um, our product is heavy in both of those things. So we, we knew that um, we needed to get to a full browser. Um, we saw that it was kind of possible, and there might be a path towards it, so we went for it. Um, and we had to ask ourselves the question, how do you run a full browser in AWS Lambda? So the first thing you've got to start with, if you've ever used uh, Docker Selenium, you've got to start with a screen. Um, we used XVFB for that, and that is X Virtual Frame Buffer. 
And it, this is used in the Docker version of Selenium Grid. And basically what it does is it simulates a video device and it has a place for you to send all your frames to. Um, so we built on top of uh, some work done by Noah Isaacson. Um, we uh, custom built the binary specifically for Lambda um, so that we could use it for running a full browser in AWS Lambda. The next biggest step here was actually getting a build of Chrome to run in Lambda with the screen. Um, so if you've ever used Lambda and tried to get behind the scenes, um, a lot of the libraries and the kernel that's included with Lambda um, are a little bit about out of date. So in order to run new binaries in Lambda, you have to um, package all of your libraries together with your binaries when you put them in Lambda. And in order to use those, sometimes you have to overwrite the ones that are in, uh, that exist in Lambda using um, environment variables. So what we were able to do is we packaged all of the stuff necessary for Chrome, and we were able to tweak the environment a little bit so that we could get our newer binaries to run in Lambda. Um, and that way, we were able to finally get Chrome running. Um, this, this is supported by Lambda. It's in their documentation. And they say, if you want your own libraries, here's the change to this to use them, yeah. so they're very fully supported. Bring your own stuff. <laughs> um, so what is missing from this slide is the month and a half of me pulling out my hair, um, trying to <laughs> compile Chrome. <laughs> um, what we managed to figure out is that if you use uh, the GTK2 version of Chrome, um, it uses a slightly older libraries, and it's a little more friendly to the AWS Lambda environment. And, and it is supported by the Chrome project. They, they still support GTK2. You just have to compile it yourself, yep. but they won't tell you how. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. We, we handled that. So now we have this full version of Chrome. We've got it running in AWS Lambda. Um, what's the next step from there? So another limit of AWS Lambda, remember, you've got to play by the rules when you're in the AWS Lambda environment. And one of the rules is that you have to limit your deployment size to 250 megabytes. And if you've ever had a testing project, you know that your dependencies can kind of get out of hand sometimes. And there was no way that we were going to fit Chrome and XVFB and then all of our dependencies for our Java test code in that same package. It so makes you regret pulling in 10 different assertion libraries. <laughs> <laughs> so to tackle that, we wanted to keep our footprint small. I wanted to do anything that we could um, to reduce that deployment package size. And if you're using AWS Lambda, there's uh, three gigabytes of memory that you can use, and there's also a temp working directory that's writable that you can uh, pull in files up to 500 megabytes. So we decided to offload um, some of that space into that temp directory to be able to pull in a lot more code than would normally be allowed. So what we do, is we package up Chrome and XV XVFB with all their libraries and everything into some TARs, put that in S3, and then as soon as the Lambda function starts, it pulls all that code down from S3, unzips it into the temp directory, and then there you can start and run them from there. And, uh, because you're on uh, Amazon's backbone, it, it's pretty much instant. And uh, I, you know, at first I'm like, oh, that sounds expensive, but it's like, you know, after a million S3 gets, it's like a penny or something. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, another advantage that we pulled off here, um, if you, so we have this memory available as well. So when we do the pull from S3, we actually hold those files in memory. We do a little bit of cleanup, which I'll get to later, um, before we actually run a test. So we're able to kind of wipe the entire uh, temp directory before we start a test. And then we just have, we have S3, or we have XVFB in Chrome in memory. We just write it back, and we don't have to download it from S3 again. So your next execution is going to be a lot faster than the first one, um, which is an advantage. And that leads us to debugging. All righty, that was uh, hinting at earlier. Um, it's great to have videos. Um, so one of our goals going into this is like, if I had a full browser, I could have videos. And it's, it's really hard, hard, hard to make that happen. Uh, this is why um, products uh, like Sauce Labs are so great, because you don't have to worry about that. Um, but trying to implement this ourselves, uh, in the past, when we're running Selenium grids, uh, when we have nodes that share test sessions, so you've got more than one test running at a time, you really, if you record a video of, uh, of everything, you're gonna see like three tests running, and like you just hope that your window's in the front of the other ones. Uh, so, you know, that's got limited utility, so it's kind of rolling the dice. Um, so, uh, we would have to, there's, you know, 
you have to be pretty disciplined about how you would set up your Selenium grid if you were able to record videos. Um, but with Lambda, since we're running tests, they're all isolated, and we're not running more than one test and one Lambda execution since uh, we're not penalized for consuming parallel nodes, uh, then it made this a lot easier. So uh, artifacts such as videos or logs, Chrome driver logs, mm -hmm. Chrome logs, uh, they're a lot easier to come by and you know, they're a lot more insightful. Sometimes there's some nasty Chrome bugs that you only see in the Chrome driver log. Uh, and that way you don't have to stop blaming yourself for ruining the test when it was Chrome's fault and you can prove it. Or you know, sometimes it's our fault. So logs, uh, standard out. So uh, on top of any test artifacts you leave, the standard output of your actual uh, Lambda execution is automatically captured transparently uh, through the CloudWatch service. And uh, well, we capture these in our test framework but, um, and, and make links, but the session IDs and all the logging information is fully searchable in CloudWatch. So anytime there's something that's gone awry or a bug with our Lambda mm -hmm. you know, implementation, we can still find out. Um, so it's not, it's not like it just goes you know, into dev null, but it's there and you don't really have to think about it. Uh, log retention, it'll delete them for you. Um, so having this isolated execution, for us, it's, it's like this holy grail of troubleshooting information that it's this, especially with really big test suites and really big teams, it's hard to maintain because you're babysitting servers, babysitting file shares, oh, it filled up, it crashed a test. Um, and as soon as something breaks, you know, you actually have a finger to point at, like, what actually went wrong. It's not just like, who's who? Yeah, and there's, you know, of course, there's always a person in the room that throws out a red herring of, like, you know, what caused the issue. But if you have nothing, you know, like, the burden of proof is always on the testing folks. And if you don't have proof, then no one's going to believe you. And then, of course, it is, it's so easy to derail uh, credibility or to... Uh, to like erode trust in your test suites and, and the whole point you're going about it. Um, this is an example of what the standard out looks in CloudWatch. The, the standard output appears to be in CloudWatch. Like, uh, I mean, this, you can do it for a specific test or if you just want to search everything for a certain like string that may be uh, something crashed and you, you know what it looks like, you still got it there. Um, okay. Now, uh, I would like to reveal to you folks uh, something called Allure Reports. Um, we are a big fan of this reporting platform. There is a team uh, based out of Russia uh, under the organization QA Meta that has done just an outstanding job on this reporting engine. They make it work with every test framework. Uh, they Every, make us look so good. We don't have to. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. it accommodates any situation. Uh, you move. I, we've got uh, Protractor. We got JUnit, Ruby, Python. We they all work with it really well. And it doesn't matter uh, the methodology you use. It's it's very cleverly laid out, so it can accommodate just about any type of approach you use. Um, and it's uh, responsive layout. It works beautiful on an iPad. It works great on any browser. Um, they have very exhaustive tests for it. Uh, if you have, you know, if you use the JUnit format, it uh, natively imports them all. So you can make your JUnit, you know, 10,000 JUnit files. It will reinterpret them into a nice format like this. And so you can, uh, you know, feel confident about showing this to somebody and that it uh, organizes it. And this is an example of uh, some of our, uh, our uh, tests for our actual Lambda service itself. We were very big advocates of our test frameworks, code is code. We test all of our test code. And we are very adamant about being confident about things that we write uh, for developers for the frameworks so that if you know, they want to question the quality, I can show them the test suite that ran and everything's working. So it's not us, it's you. Uh, <laughs> but if, hey, you know, it's, you know, if it's us, it's us. And we'll, we'll fess up to it. But um, you can see we're testing, like, you know, if a test fails, that it shows up in the report. And we have all those different the links over there. I have uh, links to all the artifacts, Chrome log, Chrome driver log, console log, test video. And this is on every test. So just being able to send somebody a URL to the test case failure with the stack trace and everything, you know, in a Slack chat, it's really nice. It really saves a lot of uh, discussion and back and forth. 
Um, so this is another feature of the Allure reports. This is the uh, timeline view, um, and it's actually cut off. So what you're looking at here, um, if you look from top to bottom, that's each Lambda executor. So Allure supports the notion of an executor, whether it be a, a Jenkins node or a Docker node or a Selenium grid node. If you're, it's, it's really just a reflection of how many things are running in parallel. So this is only showing the 30 of them, but it's too big. There's actually 60 rows. Uh, and that means we're running 60 tests at the same time. Um, this was sort of a right size for us because um, you know, the backend system under test was uh, just a little bite size one for development. And if we do uh, you know, 1,000 at once, uh, then our functional tests become rude tests and crash the system. So <laughs> this, this has saved our butt in numerous occasions because whenever you're dealing with parallel processing of anything, it's really hard to know what's actually happening in there and to have a visual representation of what's happening in Lambda at the same time, uh, we can start to see patterns and we can start to see you know, when certain tests started running and it would break the whole system. We would see that because all the tests would drop off the map as soon as a certain test ran. Um, it made it really easy to identify parallel issues um, and also tests that weren't performing in the way that they well, should Well, we, we thought we had uh, happy path tests, but there were rude tests lurking in there. <laughs> Um, and now uh, talk about a little bit deeper about running tests in Lambda. So now that we've built out all of the infrastructure and everything that we need to actually run these tests, how do we actually execute them? So what we built is um, a Java test framework built on JUnit. Um, and what it does is this framework handles everything. It, it's an all-in-one piece of equipment. Um, this test framework, it deploys itself into Lambda, Lambda uh, during the execution of the tests. Um, it's calling the Lambda function that it deployed. Um, it cleans up after itself, and then it's handling all of its own reporting. We kind of wanted to have a one-stop shop and all of our infrastructure be in this test framework, um, which really enables us to move faster and make changes a lot easier. Um, what we're looking at here is this is actually what happens when we start our test run. So They're first... Pipeline. <laughs> uh, we compile an Uber jar, and if you aren't familiar with an Uber jar, this is uh, your code plus all the dependencies um, into a single jar. Um, and what that does is you can place it anywhere, um, and you can run it anywhere. The jar is this uh, Java lingo for a zip file. Um, so then, once you have that all together, the test runner starts. Um, what the test runner does is it uploads that jar to S3 um, into a deployment bucket. Uh, you, you have to use an S3 deployment bucket if your deployment is past a certain size, um, and it's just a lot simpler to use uh, code that way. So once it's in S3, we deploy that Lambda function. So at this point, we have the test runner, and then the code is also deployed in Lambda. It's pretty much a virtual copy at this point. But there's um, a entry point into that Lambda function in our test code. So once it's deployed, the test runner gathers a list of all these tests that we want to run, depending on how we organize our suites. Um, and so it's got this list of tests. And then uh, we control the concurrency, so we don't want to run stuff too fast. But we start sending those test requests into AWS Lambda, um, where the entry point is waiting um, to receive those test requests. And then it knows what tests to run in Lambda. Um, and then it will report back when it's done. And then we can kick off another Lambda function if there's more tests to run. And um, this is all orchestrated in JUnit, so if you've ever done th uh, parallel execution and test frameworks, it, it knows what tests are in its suite. And so we just leverage that to you know, run 30 at a time, run 60 at a time, run 100 at a time. Uh, but you know, we, we use the, uh, some of the hooks in JUnit to make it um, send a message to Lambda and wait for the response. Which is nice, because we just hook in at the spot where it would run the test locally, and we just send that off to Lambda. It runs it there, comes back and the test runner doesn't know the difference where it ran. And so we can run tests locally and in Lambda in parallel at the same time, depending on if something doesn't fit there. And the, um, the person writing the test, the user of the framework doesn't need to know about Lambda. So they can write and develop the test locally, and we can really leverage the resources of our team. Uh, we don't have to burden them with all this uh, deep Selenium knowledge. Uh, if you know, give them a great tool to use, they write the test for us. They run it and get it working locally, check it in, then it runs in Lambda, and so they don't have to run you know, they don't need to wait on 800 tests on their local laptop, which will, you know, go out to lunch and never come back. Uh, <laughs> but with, uh, it's nice because if, once they're ready to do a full regression, they can check, uh, check in their commit and, you know, look at their Lua report. Um, 
So once we've got um, Lambda starts executing their tests, uh, the test is running in Lambda, and you start collecting you know, screenshots, videos, logs, everything that we're talking about in debugging. You've got all this stuff. Where do you put it? You don't really want to send it back to the test runner. The test runner doesn't care about that stuff. Uh, we just put it into S3. And then we just send back links to the test runner. Because uh, that's all we really care about. We don't need to download you know, multiple gigs of all the stuff that we just generated. Um, so we just put that into S3. And then when you're looking in the report, we've just got references to those uh, locations. So that way, when you've got this highly distributed architecture thing going, you don't blow up uh, your server where you're trying to get all your results from. And then, um, this was especially true with Jenkins. If you try to host a two gig report, it doesn't get, it doesn't uh, really like that. Yeah, that way you can be, um, you know, responsible uh, users of Jenkins if anybody's ever uh, had Jenkins issues. <laughs> Um, so now that, now that we had all those S3 locations, we generate that alert report at the end, um, and then we finish. And the test runner keeps track of if tests passed or failed or not, um, and it'll give you that result at the end. So once we get into Lambda, there's a whole other set of instructions that's happening um, that is transparent to the tests. Um, so the test runner is sending in that test request. Um, once it gets into Lambda, it meets the Lambda test handler. And what the Lambda test handler does um, is it cleans the environment. So uh, if there's files in temp, we want to get rid of those. If there's uh, things in memory, we want to kind of clean those out. Um, and we make sure that the test running has a clean area to run in, because you don't want to have uh, leftover stuff from the well, last Well, just uh, to clarify, uh, so the way uh, Amazon runs Lambda service, um, um, they control, and you don't even know really when it's going to happen. Sometimes they'll reuse the container. And so although it's the same code that we deployed, uh, that, you know, it might reuse it sometime. You don't know when. That's up to them. So sometimes, uh, and they don't, they, they, may, they don't really quite reveal this in their marketing, but, uh, you know, if you have leftover assets after an execution ran, and then the next time it gets called, and you had uh, temp files on, on the temp directory, they're still there. If, if you, like, uh, have, like, set a static field value in Java, like into something, if you go to the next execution, that this, it doesn't reset the state. It's still there. So, like I said, it's the you take the mystery away from Lambda. It's just like any other. And, um, and that goes back to the happy happy path tests um, and being nice to other tests. If you're setting static variables and you're doing things that probably shouldn't be done, setting global variables, you're going to know really quick when you start running this because uh, you have. Uh, all these tests running in parallel. But um, that, and it gets and very that was, apparent. and that was the motivation for the cleanup. We thought, well, let's start cleaning it up. Maybe that'll work. And we have actually pretty successful as long as you clean things up at the beginning. And your can, test code is not naughty. So yeah, yeah. Uh, then you can you can reuse them safely. Yeah. So once once we've done all this cleanup, which is very crucial, um, we download Chrome and XVFE from S3. And like I mentioned earlier. If we've already got this in memory, we don't have to do it again. We just write it to the temp directory, and then we're ready to go. So we start that virtual screen. Um, we've got a virtual screen running. We wait until it's started. And this is all handling. This is all outside of the test at this point. Um, and then once that screen started, we're ready to begin the test. So uh, with that test request that came in, uh, we use it to find the test that wanted to be executed. We call it, um, and then the test starts to take over. So at the start of the test, um, in a before method, we just uh, start doing that FFmpeg reporting. Um, we want the, the test is handling all of its own reporting, so we pass this responsibility off to the test itself. Um, because if there was, if this was happening in the test handler, there's no way to get it into the reporting tool um, because it's, this is all happening within the test itself. So we've got a recording started, we've got a screen started, um, and then whenever the test's ready, it opens a Chrome driver, and uh, the Chrome driver that we're using has a special set of flags um, to make sure that it can run in Lambda. Um, and it also knows that it's running in Lambda. So um, it doesn't, to the end user, it doesn't matter where you're running. If you're on your local machine, it just starts a normal Chrome driver. But if it detects that it's running in Lambda, it's going to give you a Lambda Chrome driver. Um, and everything's already set into place uh, to allow that to happen. Um, and then we execute our tests like we normally would. Um, and then at the end of the test, uh, if we've taken, since we've taken video, uh, we've got these logs and screenshots. Uh, we've hooked into the alert reporting uh, library, and we send that off to S3 so that we're not bogging down our uh, test runner. And then once we've done that, we can finish the test. Um, so we send that result back to the 
uh, Lambda test handler, and then the Lambda test handler sends that back to the uh, test runner. And test runner, if uh, it needs to run more tests, it'll kick another one off, or if not, um, it'll end it. And that's pretty much it. But how fast can this thing go? <laughs> the, the question on everyone's mind. So we have 800 tests. And uh, if you run that at four threads, that's pretty normal for um, you know, a parallel build. You can maybe get eight somewhere in there. That's kind of where we were at uh, before we went this route. Um, it takes about 60 minutes to run. This is, um, this is end to end suite. These are big tests. They might take three, 30, 40 seconds each test. It's just, that's how long a workflow takes to run, because they're big. Yeah. Um, so with Lambda, we're running those same 800 tests at 60 threads in parallel, and it takes us about six minutes. Um, so this is just so valuable for our developers because it comes back as quick as possible, um, and they don't have to wait you know, an hour for their end-to-end -end tests to run. Um, and it's been really great for debugging tests and just you know, moving as quick as possible. Um, but you know, with great speed comes great responsibility. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, so you know, we're only running sixty at a time. You know, why don't we run all of them at the same time? Well, uh, that depends if your system under test is the resources are provisioned to handle that much concurrency. Because you know, when does the functional test become a performance test? And well, why not just oh, we'll just put more resources in? Well, you know, now. Now you're, it's an ROI question, because you're gonna, the, because if you have over 100 people running builds all day and each person gets their own isolated environment to run the build against on each check-in, uh, that takes some resources. So we know we wanna be uh, efficient in trying to not run up a huge bill just for run builds, uh, if we can help it, you know, right size. So uh, if six minutes gives us a fa really fast feedback and it's still very economical, but to run it all in one minute uh, is going to, you know, be an extra, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars a month just to get that extra couple five minutes. Are they running any more builds that day? Did that does that extra five minutes saved, six versus one, actually contribute that much to productivity at that point? Uh, that's the question we asked, and we didn't really s s could justify <laughs> um, provisioning giant instances just to be able to say we can run them all at once. So while the speed is there when you need it, um, for example, like if you are using it for a performance test, well, <laughs> you are in luck because this will help you. Um, but for functional testing, we, you know, you want the system under the test to be stable to actually test the workflows and use uh, performance testing should be its own separate effort because um, it has a completely different set of considerations. And um, just some lessons we learned. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, we were wondering what would happen uh, when we would be able to run this fast since it, you know, we spent years trying to get to this point, uh, speeding up suites and things. And um, it was a little anticlimactic. Um, there isn't a magic switch that you can throw to solve all of your testing and quality problems. Uh, making quality software is very hard. Um, that's why we're all here and doing this. If it was that easy, uh, there wouldn't be so many crap locations in the world. Uh, scaling is possible, but you must follow best practices. Listen to Angie. Uh, she knows what she's talking about. Um, if, you're not, if you're not covering all your bases uh, with just like test hygiene and writing a good suite, and if you got organizational issues, and you know, that's where you need to focus your efforts first. Parallelizing tests is great, but it's not helpful if you have organizational problems around your test suite, or if you um, don't have control of your test suite, or, you know, so many people at this conference have a lot of things to say about that, and it can't, I can't, like, uh, bolster that enough. You need to follow best practices. If um, you got a big team and you want it to be more effective, that's where you should put your focus first. And then once you... Once you reach that maturity, then you can get the benefits of scaling the suite further, making things faster, increasing velocity. Um, this, the whole concept of continuous delivery and software as a service and releasing often and stop uh, naming your products with the year. Um, so you don't, you know, my product 2018 released in 2020. Uh, this, is, this is sort of like a mature end to that is increasing the velocity. 
So we release now, you know, in weeks and months at a time, we make release candidates all the time. We used to release in like a year, and it was because we had an ice cream cone and we needed a pyramid. Uh, and then one funny thing <laughs> is uh, running faster only kind of uncovered our, some of the problems that were lurking. We, we took the uh, culture push as, as far as was practical and felt like we could now benefit from speed. But, um, you know, human eyes are only so effective. And if we don't, this running faster gave us a lot of insight into the health of our suite since we had so many people contributing all the time and had a very large amount of tests. Uh, it was hard to like really see when we had rude tests. And then, you know, Having things show up in a little report, we have a nice, nice metrics. Uh, we were able to get rid of the root tests, and then we got a great happy path suite. And so now, people actually trust, trust the test results. When they see red, they're like, oh, it's a product defect. We got rid of all of our root tests. We're confident about these tests. If a test <coughs> breaks or goes broken or goes bad, then we, then we can easily see that. And it happens occasionally, like once in a blue moon. It's not happening on every build. So, because when you have untrustworthy test suite, it's the same as not having testing at all because no one's really paying attention to them. And, and then that's extremely embarrassing because you spent so much time making it and the bug still got out. So um, that was kind of our lessons learned. I know, listen, uh, I wish it was, I wish it was uh, solving all of your problems, but um, it definitely gave us, let us reach a new height but um, kind of really just expose what we already knew. Keep doing what you're doing and following best practices. Um, and just to uh, circle back around with some shout outs, Allure reports, um, please like, Google them and check them out. You will not regret it. And um, we get so many compliments from people on our team about the reports, like, hey, we love this new report. Like, oh, it's not ours, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it makes life easier. Um, Marco Luthi, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, he is a hero. Uh, he spent a lot of his own time uh, working with the Chrome team, working out bugs, figuring out things, building Chrome on his laptop, which takes a day uh, for many months to kind of get that core groundwork laid and um, really get people excited about running it on Lambda. Um, Alistair Scott, um, for his helpful test pyramid images. Um, he's actually got a great blog, uh, so check it out. Uh, Noah Isaacson for his uh, work on XVFB on Lambda. And um, also wanted to give you guys uh, just a heads up um, about how to make tests less rude. Um, Jane Waldrip, our colleague at Blackboard, will be presenting tomorrow on three ways not to use Selenium. So if you have the time, please check it out. Um, we do have a GitHub. We uh, published examples of how you could go about it. Um, this currently is showing uh, where we started a year ago during our brainstorming phase, and we were going to go ahead and flip on um, what we've worked on since then. So you'll get to see uh, the difference Big and push. how one way to use it. Um, we're not saying this is, this is like the way everyone should use it. In fact, I think there's, we think that this should be a component of things that are already out there, really great projects. It's not replacing anything. I think it's just kind of complimenting what's there. It's not, it's not a game changer. Don't, don't throw it all away and switch to our GitHub. It's not what we're advocating. It's just, a, it's an example, just so you can have a relevant, something to look at and, and learn from it. It's just a learning tool. Um, we, uh, you know, the open, open source projects are amazing. And when you got a big community around something, I don't think, you know, I don't think you should advocate getting rid of a community if it's, it's solving a good problem. And uh, if you have questions, um, we actually have plenty of things to show you, live demos and, uh, and whatnot. I just you know, wanted to spare, spare you guys from our demos messing up, because of course it'll happen for us uh, if we did it here. But um, we have office hours at 1.30. Um, please, if you see us, uh, just ask questions. We'd love, love to uh, we'll try to answer your questions. All right. Thank you. All right. Enjoy lunch.